Welcome to Pokemon Eon Guardians, a new Pokemon game where you get chosen by Latios and Latias as the hero to try and protect the Terror region. This game is absolutely beautiful to look at. If a French chef would look at this game, he would say Bon Appetit. It has a quest system with over 50 quests, an entire new roster of characters. This game's story is in my top 5 favorites, not only because it seems very fresh and original, but also because it's executed very well. There is an insanely large list of quality of life improvements, but my main draw to this game was Latios and Latias because I think they're a little bit overlooked and they really made them shine here, just like in their very own movie. Let's try to hit 380 or 381 likes because those are their Pokedex numbers, and for now, let's soar our way through Pokemon Eon Guardians. When you boot up your game, you can choose between easy or hard mode. I went for easy because that magic art was just looking at me the wrong way. To spice things up, I also decided to put on the randomizer mode, but only for the wild Pokemon and gift Pokemon. So all of the regular trainers will have their normal teams. Then get greeted by Professor Spruce. She lets you choose between the boy and girl character, and I do have to say, these are very good designs. Once that's done, you have to do a little personality quiz. I have no idea if this actually impacts the story. Once you complete this mystery dungeon quiz, you see a blurred screen of blue fighting red for the championship match in Kanto. As it turns out, this was three years ago and we're watching this match right now to get some inspiration because we're starting our very own journey today. In the middle of the tape, our mom calls us downstairs because she has a surprise for me. And that's my older sister Aqua, who is actually the sixth gym leader in this game, so she's going to give you a pep talk and can't wait until we grow up and finally challenge her. She also gives me my running shoes and sends me off to Professor Spruce. So after making my way through Pebble Town, we easily make our way to the lab. But just before we can enter, we get interrupted by our rival who is a little bit late. And after giving her the name Kira, she decides to hype me up and walk into the lab with me. After talking to Professor Spruce, she mentioned that there should be a third trainer that starts his journey today. And just at that moment, he shows up. He says that his name is Ken, and he'll of course be the next Pokemon champion. I try to politely greet him, but he just says, yeah, whatever. So it turns out that he's actually just a douchebag. The professor then takes us to the back and we see these three beautiful areas for grass, water, and fire starters. You can only choose between the first four generations of Pokemon, but that's absolutely no problem as I went in and chose Chimchar, who because of my randomizer turned into an EV, which I named Carbon. We go back to the main area and this time it's Ken that can choose his next Pokemon. And while he's away, me and Kira start gossiping how will beat him up and be way stronger than him because he's such a douchebag. He then returns, which means that it's Kira's time to go back in, and the man really is my rival because he started off with a Mudkip. I can't let him get away with this, so I challenge him to a Pokemon battle. Because of my normal typing stab tackles, managed to knock out his cute little Mudfish. Obviously, he just says that I won by luck and then leaves the lab. So Kira and the professor come back in, but Ken actually shouldn't have left yet because the professor still had a package for us. The mailman then comes in in, delivers this package, but after checking the packages, we realize that they have been switched with the wrong professor. Professor Kalids has gotten our package and we've gotten his. So she asks if me and Kira want to go up to his lab to try and trade the packages. Since he doesn't live too far, we obviously agree, and after a short hike up the mountain, we arrive at his research station, and he seems to be a weather professor, because there's a ton of windmills outside as well as a cast form inside. As we enter his house, he comes up to us and asks if we have seen his glasses glasses, but they're just on his face, so he must be a very sloppy guy. We proceed to ask about the package situation, but he already threw out the package because it wasn't his. So after digging through the trash, he finally finds it again, and we get our package back and he gets his. So now he can use his Cast Forminator 3000 all he wants and we head back to the lab. As it turns out, this is a package from Professor Oak that Professor Spruce ordered specifically for us, and if Professor Oak is in the picture, it's obviously going to be a Pokedex. So she hands him to me and also orders me to go and find Ken because he forgot his. We leave the lab and say our goodbyes to our mother because she's obviously going to miss her little boy. She shows me how to let my Pokemon out of the Pokeball and let them follow me. And I know a lot of you love following Pokemon. This is definitely a lovely addition. After going through the second round, we reach Little Quartz Town where we have to head to the Pokemon Mart because all of the items in the overworld are randomized and I still haven't found any Pokeballs yet. So it's time to buy some. I then grab my 
first couple encounters starting off with Boom the Electrode, Barry B the Beedrill, and Peach the Mamoswine. Next up on the list, Titania City, where we immediately get greeted by two statues of Latios and Latias, but Kira is also here. She explains more about Latios and Latias and that they're the Eon Guardians that make sure the Terra region stays safe. We're also here to start our Pokemon League application so that we can start collecting all of the gym badges and eventually maybe become champion. As I'm going up the stairs to try and get to the Pokemon League building, I get stopped by Ken who is once again mocking me for slacking behind because he's already started his Pokemon League journey. But I shut him up real quick by taking down his Puchena with Mamoswine and his beautiful Mudkip with Boom the Electrode. We then head inside, complete our application and get the League Ball which will allow us to participate in the Pokemon League challenge ourselves. Upon heading to the next round, I do find myself a Kecleon and capture that, but I also run into a Regigigas that's level 6, which funnily enough is only 5 levels higher than the one in Platinum. And the legends don't stop there because in my first cave I encountered Mewtwo, which was pretty fitting. After that, Giovanni kicked me out of that cave and into the distortion world where I got eaten by Giratina and inside I managed to capture a skunk tank. Once that was done, we had our first encounter with the evil team called Team Gaia. But don't worry, it's totally different from the wrong hack Gaia. He's trying to steal this girl's Pokemon and we obviously stop him. Once the battle's over, he flees and says that this won't be the last thing we see from Team Gaia. The girl also thanks me and gives me an Eevee as a reward, which we don't need because we already have one. When we leave the cave, we do run into Latias, which is very cool. And after our very cute encounter is over, she decides to leave the Soul Dew with me. Rebecca, a scientist that is researching Latias and Latios, then comes over and explains that they have telepathic abilities to communicate with humans. So she naturally asks if Latias told me anything. Well, it didn't really talk to us, so if we run into any of the two again, we need to go and report to her. But first, a word of our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Raycon. If you've ever wanted to listen to Cynthia's theme in the best quality possible, these guys have got you covered. When you're outside and you're doing a Pokemon Go event which lasts the entire day sometimes, and you want to listen to music the entire day, well, Raycon gives you up to 8 hours of playtime and 32 hours of total battery life. If you want to talk to your friends with these earbuds in, that's possible too because they have an awareness mode and when you're done you can immediately switch to noise isolation mode to cancel out all of the background sounds. They have a variety of colors so if you're a shiny hunter you can get all of them. I personally went with black because they just fit with most of my clothing. And they're also about half the price of competitors and if you don't like them, Recon has also got a 30 day free return policy. So if you haven't found your earbuds yet, give Raycon a shot by clicking the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash wiggo to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Thank you to Raycon for sponsoring this video and let's jump right back into it. But first we head over to Amberdale and meet up with Kira because this is her hometown and she's going to try and challenge the first gym leader here. But before challenging her, she wants to know if she's worthy and battles me instead. But she had a pretty weak team of a Hapini, Mareep and Chikorita, which we just bulldozed over. As a reward for winning the battle, she gives me an eternal potion, which just works as a Poké Center visit for when you're in between battles. But you can only use it once, then you have to use another Pokémon Center to refill it. Then it's time to challenge the first gym leader, Patricia, and she specializes in electric types, but because we have an electric type of our own, we easily won against the first two Pokémon with Sonic Booms. Then we just finish off her Chincha with some camouflages. And as a reward, we don't only get a gym badge and a TM, but also an ability. And not just an ability like smashing rocks or surfing on water. No, passive abilities that will help you throughout your entire playthrough. Which is a very welcomed addition. And the first one we unlocked might as well be the most useful one. Accuracy of moves is increased. But with that out of the way, we make our way through the forest into Route 8. And here we meet Rebecca again. As it turns out, there is an Eon Shrine here that's been built many centuries ago to worship both of the Eon Guardians. And we're going to have to check it out. After getting overwhelmed by the aura that hangs in this place, we start searching around for any clues and find a very special puzzle that I complete in no time. It resembles an egg and opens up a special doorway in the back of the shrine. In here we find a stone tablet with a very old transcript on it. And Rebecca thinks that finding this room has something to do with me. So in order to find out what's so special about me, she wants a battle. She had a pretty interesting team of a Bronzor, Baltoy and a shiny Ryo which was 
very cool to see, but nothing my powerhouses couldn't handle. Okay, maybe that Togepi was a little scary, but after the battle, something catastrophic happens. Team Gaia walk in and tell us to step back from the stone tablet because they're going to steal it from this place, transcribe it, and use its secrets against the world. But we can't let them do that, so we challenge them, and the winner of this battle will be able to read the stone tablet first. But while I was battling some of the grunts, the third grunt stole the stone tablet right under our noses, and once our battle was over, they were able to escape with it. Once their smokescreen disappears, something incredible happens though. The crystal behind us starts glowing up and we get a vision. And not just any vision, a vision of Arceus. It's the seventh day of his creation, and on this day he created Latios and Latias, the Eon Guardians. They're supposed to protect people and Pokemon from evil and make sure that everybody can live in peace. And in order to help them out, he gave them the telepathic ability to try and communicate with humans, so if anybody tries to rebel against nature, they will be able to stop them with their power or choose somebody that will save the region because they know they have the potential. Once the vision's over, Rebecca doesn't believe her eyes and is like, was that Arceus? What just happened? She realizes that it has got to do something with this crystal, and that's when we show her the soul drew that Latias gave us a couple of days ago. In order to find out more about Latios and Latias, we have to head over to the next Eon Shrine because she just thinks that there will be another crystal there and we will have another vision. So we part ways for now and go back on our adventure to reach Liditia. In Liditia, there is some sort of bug catching contest, but it's now replaced by a ghost catching contest like the Ghostbusters. The person who catches the scariest ghost wins. I managed to grab a Vileplume, which is not too scary, but it isn't a special dark Pokeball, but I'm pretty glad with another third evolution just before the second gym badge. Speaking of him, his name is Seth, and he specializes in dark types to take down the ghosts of this town. He even has a ghost of himself, a Sableye, which I take down with charge beams from my electrode, getting a ton of special attack boosts to take down Murkrow too. I then do go down by Absol, but I was able to once again get it down into red health with charge beam, then bring in my flower, Mega Drain, and get my second gym badge. With that, we can leave town, but Ken stops us. He's surprised that we've already made it this far and says that we've probably been skipping trainers. He mentions that we're flying way too high to our liking and he's going to bring us down. He has a pretty decent team by now, starting out with a Mygena that gets destroyed by Electrode, then a Tauros, and somehow my little Kecleon deals with that with using Dizzy Punches. He also has a Marsh Tom, which is very strong, and even managed to take down my Grass type, Marsh Tom's biggest kryptonite. So instead I had to finish it off with Beedrill's Acrobatics, and with a Volt Switch and a Charge Beam from Electrode, we do kill his last Pokemon Scyther and kick his big ass butt. He's very impressed with my level of skill, but he also thinks that I'm not working hard enough and that I shouldn't sleep on this victory because next time he will come back way stronger. Obviously that's not what I'll be doing because I'll immediately strengthen my team by capturing Patrick the Starmie and Salmon the Milotic. As I'm trying to get to the next city, I get blocked by a sheep herder with his flock of Mareeps. But there's a little problem though. Three of his Mareeps have been taken away, scared off by Puchienas, which means he can't leave until he has them back, so he asks me to try and get them. So we follow Route 10 up until Copper Canyon, where we meet up with his daughter who's already searching for the Puchienas. That took away the Mareep. She has searched the entire canyon but hasn't found them, so this is going to be our job. I found the first two pretty quickly, but then I got distracted and entered the next town, which was Marmor Town. It had some amazing things here, like a daycare with the Yoshi eggs on top of it, but most importantly, the coolest event I have ever seen in any Pokemon fan game. There's a well here with a shady looking guy next to it, and he says that there is a hidden treasure all the way at the bottom of the well, so we jump in and he jumps after us and is like, you're a stupid, greedy little kid. There's absolutely no treasure here, I'm just here to steal all of your Pokemon and money. We're not going to go down without a fight, but as you battle him and look at his name you see that it's Patches and if you've ever played Elden Ring before this name will ring a bell because he's a little side character that is very loved by the Elden Ring fans and since I'm pretty much an Elden Ring fan I absolutely love this little easter egg. If you manage to beat him up in this battle he will become your friend and even give you a reward and say that he will leave you alone and that if we do 
find a treasure, we can keep it all to ourselves and then just leaves. We then go out of the well and go up to the next round and run into a power plant where we see the electric type gym leader. She mentions that there is a lot of problems here, a Pokemon has been disturbing the peace and the power plant doesn't work properly anymore and she needs a trainer to go in and turn on a switch so that we can turn up the electricity again. As it turns out, in the deepest parts of the power plant, a Rodom is causing all of the havoc and making sure all of the electricity is totally out of control. So after beating up the Golem? I guess this is a new form of Rotom. We flip the switch and everything goes back to normal. We go back to the gym leader who gives me a nature ball as a reward and then goes back to her gym. Now, I totally forgot about the Mareep, so we head back to the canyon just to see that one of the Mareeps was almost eaten by a pack of Puchenas. We destroy all of them, save the little sheep, bring her back to her owners. Just as we're about to follow them and head on over to the next city, we get stopped by a shady looking character. She mentioned that we should have just left the Mareep to die because that's the way that nature goes and we shouldn't have interfered because the world is all about the strongest will always be on top and survive so she's all for natural selection which is definitely not a good sign. She realizes that we're a strong trainer ourselves and ends the conversation by saying that we should keep this strength and cherish it. We then reach round 11 where two grunts are talking to each other saying that they have to complete their mission otherwise the boss is going to kill them. And then they run off, so we follow just behind them and end up in Granite Deep City. Obviously, we see Kira here, and she upgrades my health potion so that it now heals 33% of my Pokemon's health and even revives them if they're fainted. We also see that the mailman that brought us that package in the first couple of minutes of the game is here too. He's supposed to deliver a special package to the department store here, but Team Gaia is here to stop him and steal that package. Once they have it, they flee the scene and we go after them them straight away. At least that's what they think but the mailman runs for it because he can't let his packages be stolen. We go after them and eventually reach a warehouse near the docks. The mailman and Kira have been ambushed by all four of the grunts and they've also managed to beat up all of their Pokemon. But even without all of their Pokemon the mailman still doesn't want to give his package. That's when Team Gaia mentions that they have to give the package to them because the strong always win. They have to wipe out all of the weaklings which makes me quite question what's in the package itself. We obviously have no idea what they're talking about and jump into the argument and beat all of the grunts in a Pokemon battle, but that's when their boss comes along. He scolds the grunts for making a job that's this easy so hard and the grunts say that it's all our fault because we're way too strong for them. Selecto, which is his name, then mentions that we have to leave, otherwise they will break our bones. But just as they're about to attack me, two other people show up and say that they're ready for a fight. They're the two gym leaders of the city, that's right. Just like Tate and Liza, these two are brother and sister and will be in charge of the gym together. The grunts don't panic, however, because the boss says that they have to go over to plan destruction. They rip the package out of the mailman's hands and destroy it. We then find out that it's full of evolutionary stones, so we don't really understand why they wanted this. Let's not even talk about destroying it. Selecto then goes on to explain that Pokemon that need evolutionary stones stones are we because they need third party items to become stronger, real strong Pokemon should evolve on their own, which is kind of messed up to think about. So they're trying their best to wipe out all of the weaklings on this planet because it's time for change. They flee the scene and the mailman still goes on to deliver the package despite it still being so broken. Luckily he has insurance for it so he shouldn't be too worried about it at all. I wish I had that good of an insurance. The gym leaders then applaud me for my braveness and invite me to their gym to try and complete their challenge. We also get a ferry ticket for our bravery, which means that after the gym we can immediately head over to our next point of interest. Before heading to the gym, I first went into one of the warehouses and as it turns out in the basement there is a fight club there. It made me think a lot about the Pyrite Colosseum in Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness and Colosseum itself and the boss here is also a big pink guy with a French accent. If you win one of the tournaments you get a pretty bad reward, I personally got a protein, so I left it alone and went to the gym. I realized that this was a status conditions gym. You have to 
to go through a certain path and reach one of the gym leaders. This path is riddled with traps of poison and electricity which will poison your Pokemon and paralyze them. But once you get to the gym leader, you get to leave and then you have to find the other gym leader. Once you're done with that, you can challenge them. And you could say I have balls or that I'm really stupid because I went in with all of my Pokemon poisoned against Roxy and Blake. And if you hadn't figured it out by now, they do specialize in poison types. This is a double battle and they have a Quillfish, Roselia, Nidoqueen and Nidoking. With Patrick the Starfish on my team, I could just Scythe Shock or use Surf to take down Quillfish and Nidoqueen, while Beedrill, Vileplume and Dusknoir were able to take down Roselia and Nidoking. We not only get the Agony Badge but also another ability. This time Pokemon's friendship will go up quicker, which is not useful for us at all. So I headed on over to the docks because I had to take the ferry to my next destination, but before we can enter the port, we get stopped by another one of our rivals. This time it's Ken again. He mocks me by saying that I'm already leaving the big city because a summit child like me can't handle this. He also says that he's already gained his next gym badge and has beaten up Kira on Route 11 and that I'm going to be his next victim. We'll see about that, buddy. His first three Pokemon on Larvitar, Growlithe and Tauros went down to Patrick's Scythe Shocks and Surfs, Ishmarstom then lost the matchup against my Beedrill, even though it was able to take down my Kecleon and Vileplume, and Barry B killed his last Pokemon, Snover. He says that he has no problem taking down every other trainer except for me, so he thinks he needs to change his strategy. Next time he'll get me though. After saying one last adios, we jump on the boat and arrive in the beautiful town of Coral. No, not the rum hack that I just reviewed, a beautiful relaxing seaside city. There's not too much to do here except for the Skarmory Center which people use to travel around the region. But they've been having problems, their Skarmories have been flying over the local desert, but every time they flew over there, some of their Skarmories went missing and some of them returned injured, which means something in the desert is attacking their Skarmories. So they send me out there to investigate. Our next round is a jungle round and over here we find our next encounter which is going to be a sizzle by far one of the best Pokemon I could have found. So after adding it to the team, I went through the jungle some more, cut down all of the vines and released my inner Tarzan and eventually sling my way over to Jade City. There's two important hotspots here, a gym and a safari zone and I head over to the safari zone first because the gym leader is missing and the last sight of her was in the safari zone. Just before entering though, Kira shows up and is like, if you want to enter the safari zone, you're going to have to beat me up first. And since beating up rivals is my profession at this point, I did that without hesitation. She does have a very cool team, starting out with a Blizzy that gets destroyed by Beedrill's Acrobatics, then going into an Ampharos that somehow goes down to Starmie Surfs, despite being weak to it, and then I get killed by a Rapidash, which I should be strong against, but I only lost to it because I got paralyzed. I then brought in Boom, killed it with two Charge Beams and a Volt Switch, which caused me to swap in Dusknoir against her Altaria, but I easily lost that matchup because I'm a little bit under level with him, so I bring in Boom again, use Charge Beams and finish it off with an Electro Ball, then do chip damage on the last Pokemon Milotic with an Electro Ball before going down, I then send in my last hope, Hugh, who is able to slurp up all of the health with Mega Drain and her final Pokemon is luckily enough her starter Meganium, so by using Sludge Bombs I win this one too. Kira defeated, we can enter the Safari Zone, and inside the house there we see Fleur, the Jade City Gym Leader. She's here to check up on all of the Pokemon in the nature preserve, but is ready to challenge me whenever and heads back to her gym. And since this gym is in the jungle, this is the perfect opportunity to put a grass typing on it. But getting through the gym isn't as easy, you have to go through a maze, and if you take the wrong path in the forest, you get sent back all the way to the beginning. So with a lot of trial and error, I eventually reached Floor, but in her gym I managed to grind up my Scizor to level 38, and Scizor is basically the perfect Pokemon to take her on with. I easily took down Cradley, Ludicolo and Executor, or Venusaur did give me a little bit of trouble because of all of its bulk, but eventually Acrobatics let me come out on top and win me the root beer, I mean badge. We exit the gym and guess who's there? It's Aqua, our sister. We tell her the good news that we just acquired our next gym badge and she's really proud of us. Only one more gym badge before we can face her and she's very excited for that. As a reward she gives me the hoverboard which you can use used to surf over any pool of water. A very nice reward which we will use to get to our next point of interest. On my way over there I did
did capture a Claydol to add to the team and arrived in the Topaz Desert where I went looking for the Skarmory but sadly enough I couldn't find any so I headed over to the Topaz Oasis which is a little town just outside of the desert just like in Avatar where the 5th gym is located. And for a desert there is only two possibilities of a gym fire or ground. And since I was almost cooked well done after stepping in this gym, I realized that I was up against a fire type leader. The gym puzzle here was really cool, you have to run through a maze of fire and find the right tiles to step on, just like an ice puzzle. But watch out, because if you make a mistake, you'll burn in hell. Once I was done tanning, I eventually reached a gym leader whose name is Flint, just like the Elite Four member of Diamond, Pearl and Platinum. They're not related in any kind, but I do think it's pretty humorous that they have the same name. I only needed one Pokemon to extend Distinguishes flames, and that's by using Surf on Houndoom with Starmie, doing the same to Arcanine, Magmortar, and Infernape. With the Ember Badge by my side, I left the gym, but there was a call of distress because Team Kaya has taken over a research facility here. Once we're done teaching all of the grunts a lesson, we get to the end of the lab and see Selecto here once more. He's preaching to the scientists about evolution and that we humans should stop playing God and just let the natural selection of things wipe out all of the weaklings. They're not just here to preach their philosophy on people, because these researchers have been studying a virus that could wipe out anybody that's too weak to survive it. So Team Gaia wants to release it on the world to make sure evolution goes its own way again. Personally, I think that's a bit cruel, so I decided to jump in and challenge Selecto to a fight, and this was one of the hardest ones yet. His shift tree falls to a swift X scissor of Scizor, his Houndoom then takes out my Beedrill with Dark Pulses, Ice Open Starmie, and just when I'm about about to hit my second serve, he swaps out into a golem which I can then take out with serves as well, even though my Starmie only has 11 HP left from a Dark Pulse. He brings in Sharpedo and I do a ton of damage with a Dazzling Gleam but just don't kill the shark, so I then finish it off with a Charge Beam of my Electrode, also gaining more special attack in the process. I then take down his next Pokemon Metagross with Charge Beams and Discharges but his Electivire has Motor Drive which means I can't hit it with any Electric type moves and that's all my Electrode has. A couple more hits from Scizor is all I need, and that's Selecto down. We chased them out of the laboratory and saved the world from this new pandemic that they were about to start. But as it turns out, they managed to recover an artifact from the archaeology department, and we honestly don't really know what they're going to do with it. They once again politely ask me to not interfere with their team's actions anymore, and then leave. As a reward, the scientists give me a smash hammer, which we can use to break some rocks, or to spike some people off the stage. We exit the lab and have our very first encounter with Latios who just stares at me and it feels like it's scanning my soul. Once it's done, it leaves without saying a word. I try to follow it but end up finding a Flareon instead which I do add to the team despite already having an Eevee. After this I stumbled upon another Eon Shrine and you know what that means, another encounter with Rebecca who can't solve a puzzle. So we step in and make a beautiful red Latios portrait which opens up another door at the end of the shrine. This time there sadly enough isn't a stone tablet which we can read for its secrets. But there is another crystal. So Rebecca goes on to say, Abracadabra, do your magic crystal, give us another vision of the past, but that didn't happen. We then think about what triggered it last time and it must have been one of the battles. So Rebecca challenges me to a battle. After another win on our board, the shrine starts glowing and we get another flashback. Here we see Latias and Latios discovering the world for the very first time to try and find out the difference between what's good and evil. At first they see a ton of people playing with their Pokemon and having tons of fun and they realize that this is what the world should be like. But a little later they find a different spot where two people seem to be playing with a Wurmple but upon investigating further they read the Wurmple's thoughts and they say help me, these people are harassing me, attacking me, saying that I'm weak and that's when Latios and Latias jump in, save the little guy and finally realize what their job will be all about. They also realize that their telepathic powers have been given to them to do this exact thing and that's when the vision ends and we talk to Rebecca about it. These crystals seem to be the memories of Latios and Latias and the only reason that explains a little bit to why we can see them is the soul dew that we have. She's super excited about this and knows that the next Eon Shrine will be on Route 24 so that's where we'll be meeting next. In order for us to get to Route 24 though is to get through the Devil's Wrath, a very dangerous cave that is guarded by a Bonnet, Houndoom and Dusclops and if you can't beat these you can progress further. Luckily I was able to do it on my first try, make it through Route 20 which is a water route and eventually stumble upon a swamp. 
In this swamp we see Pibarel making a dam, which was damn cool to see. And just before reaching Slateburg City, we run into Ken. And he just mentioned that he beat my sister in a battle and says that my family just lacks that bit of strength to keep up with him. He also mentioned that my sister is weak, so it's time to whoop his ass. The first two Pokemon, Pupitar and Arcanine, were easy for Starmie to kill with Surf because the rain was up too. Thank the Swamp Gods for that. Then it was Scizor vs Scizor, I won this matchup with Acrobatics, luckily enough, but then he brought out a Shell Gun with Fire Fang. I was able to kill it, but because it burned me with a Fire Fang and flinched me a couple of times, we only survived with a couple of HP left as we went into Swamp Bird, which I took down with Starmie's Surfs, and the last Pokemon, Abomasnow, luckily felt the Scizor's X Scissor. After losing, he says that we've already reached the peak of his strength and that he is still reaching it, so that eventually he'll be able to beat me. He wishes me luck at the family reunion with my sister and then goes off. I reached Slateburg City, headed to the local museum and saw that they had a Mega Aerodactyl fossil, which I've never seen before but looked quite amazing. I also went to the next round and found a Garchomp there, which I added to the team with a Nature Ball, which are used to capture grass and ground Pokemon. There's also a Magikarp jump tournament in this town, but sadly enough I can't just get a Magikarp because it's a randomizer, but definitely try this out if you play this game yourself. I went to the gym to try and challenge Aqua, but she said there is a distress single from some Bimorels near the swamp. Normally they just swim about, but this time they're hiding from something, which is absolutely not normal. So upon further investigation, we see that they're getting attacked by a Gyarados. My sister wants to see how strong I've become, so she sends me out to try and take it on, which we had absolutely no problem with because it turned into a Krabby. And after seeing my potential strength, she wanted me to challenge her real good at her gym. It was pretty easy, you just have to flip some switches in order to change whirlpools from place to place, and eventually all the whirlpools will be gone and then you can enter Aqua's lair. First up, Vileplume vs Lapras. I somehow managed to win this matchup by using Seed Bomb, but her next Pokemon Blastoise put me back into place. So I decided to go into Patrick, which should have easily been able to deal with this giant turtle, but it froze me with Ice Beam and then eventually just wore me down. Scizor then proceeded to put up a good fight against Blastoise, Blastoise and Kingdra but taking both of them down, but my Lodic proved to be a little bit too much. Luckily I have a big land shark now who eats sea snakes for breakfast, so with that we have defeated Aqua. We go outside together but we forgot something. Our mom was supposed to be here and watch our battle, and when she shows up we have to tell her the bad news that she missed it all. She's not too happy about this but she is really proud of the both of us and even gives me a poison barb as a reward. She also says that Aqua can't forget get to pick her up if we eventually reach the championship match so they can watch that together. With that out of the way, our mom finally lets us go, we go to the local restaurant and pick up a random climbing pick from a hiker which will allow us to use rock climb. We now reach the famous Route 24 where we find another Eon Shrine. In the previous puzzles, we have made an egg and a Latia, so guess which one this is going to be. If you guessed Totodile, you were wrong because it was a Latios, we open up another door, battle in front of the crystal once more with Rebecca and trigger another vision. Here we see Latias and Latios choosing different chosen ones in different regions. Like in the Johto region, they told Lance that they should not interfere with the Red Gyarados event because Gold had to prove himself at that point in time and they even told Lance that they had to let Gold help him take down Team Rocket so that he could eventually become the hero that he is today. In the Horn region, they woke up Rayquaza when Groudon and Kyogre were fighting, but told Rayquaza not to go there yet and wait for Brendan to get to the top of Spare Pillar so that Rayquaza could then go to Sutupolis City without harming him. After that he can go and capture Rayquaza and become champion of the Hoenn region. And three years before that they did the same with Red and Mewtwo. They choose all of these chosen ones because Latios and Latias obviously can't be everywhere in the world themselves. Other beings need to keep the peace besides them. That's why all these legendary trainers rise up and save their regions because Latios and Latias craft the path 
for them. With that, the vision ends and Rebecca realizes that Latios and Latias choose beings with the purest souls to help them out. And the only thing we really don't understand at this point is the place that they were in while they were discussing Red. It's a place that doesn't really seem to exist in real time because there was floating platforms there. And since this is the last Eon Shrine, we might never find out. She is, however, very grateful that she was able to experience their journey through all of these crystals and now understands them better. However, we will still keep on searching for the answers ourselves. After thanking me, she heads off and then Latios and Latias come out of the wall, but just when I turn around, they disappear again. Some very weird stuff is happening here. We can't get twisted up in it too much because we have to continue our batch quest. The next road leads us to Low Clay Town, where we immediately see a team Gaia Grunt standing in front of a building to guard it. He says that his team is inside to perform some more evil misdeeds that he obviously won't let me in. Even after defeating him in a Pokemon battle, he just runs off with the key and locks the door. So we have to go after him to get this key and save the people inside. But as I'm trailing him, I get distracted by a ton of signs that point to a Pokeball. After picking it up, I fall into a pitfall and hear the same voice as with the well, saying that I'm a greedy little child and that's what I get for picking up stuff that isn't mine. This time, I won't escape him. So we make our way through the cave and run run into patches once more. He's blocking the exit of the cave as he says that we need to stop being greedy and that this will teach me a lesson. And then he just gets walloped by my team. He then makes up an excuse that he was just trying to show me and my money a way throughout this cave. And even mentions that it's crazy that we would think that he was going to rob us and then says that he's just an honest patches and that we have infiltrated his home and he's happily obliging to let us out. This sounds Sadly enough was our last encounter with Patches and it was an emotional goodbye. And I once again applaud these little easter eggs. Now it's time for us to catch a Team Gaia member, grab his key and head back to that mining engineering's lab. As we defeat all of the grunts here we eventually reach their hostage and they're trying to take the nano cutters from him. A tool that's been in development for many years and they're trying to use it for something. We don't know what but just as we start interfering their real boss and enters the building and says that she will take over. It's the same woman that came up to me in the canyon and said that the strongest will always win. That I should have let that Marib die. Welp, who guessed that she would be the leader of Team Gaia? Her name is Scarlet, but not Johansson, and she knows about everything that we've been doing to her organization, defeating Selecto in the Oasis and interfering with everything that they've been doing. She has to put a stop to me right here, right now. So let's see who's going to win, good or evil. First up is Dust Noir versus Dust Noir. And somehow this tie turned into a tie because I have a rocky helmet and he killed himself in the end. Patrick dealt with Gengar after that, got killed by Drapion, but got revenge killed by Garchomp. I also took down Milotic with Garchomp's Dragon Claws, but Tyranitar was a bit too much for me. Luckily, I still have Scizor in the back who can deal with it no problemo, and the last Pokemon, Umbreon got hacked into little pieces with x -Scissor. After the battle, she realizes that I'm a super strong Pokemon trainer and is very disappointed that we don't share their views, otherwise they could easily make their plans come to fruition. But she says that we shouldn't worry because they will just do it anyway without our help. They still managed to steal the nano cutters because I wasn't able to stop them in time and they then flee the scene saying that they're just trying to heal the world. These nano cutters that they stole can be used for medicine or just to create any kind of tool. And they clearly left through the elemental stone cave. So we go after them, no questions asked. In the deepest part of the cave, there is a railroad that goes through the mountain. But this one is blocked by a ton of rock smash and strength rocks, which also trapped a ton of workers. Since we don't have the strength HM yet, we can get through here and have to find another way out of the cave, which led us to a battle tower. You know what a battle tower is by now, so I'm not really going to explain that, but it is pretty weird that it's just on a random route. I then checked my abilities again because I forgot to check after the last gym, and I can now gain EVs faster. Which is very nice if you want to play some competitive Pokemon, but that's not really why I'm here, and I picked easy mode, so I won't really need this. I Minecraft my way through the Mining Institute and into Iron Rock City, which is coincidentally also the place of an academy. And in this academy, Professor Spruce is a professor 
professor. I mean, duh, but she teaches children here. She has two guests in her office, Professor Oak and another old guy, which seems to be her husband. Two professors are talking about evolutionary stones because Professor Spruce specializes in this. But upon walking in, Professor Oak notices me and is like, who are you? Are you one of the students that the professor sent out with one of my Pokedexes? Which is exactly what happened. But we've only captured about 25 species of Pokemon, so he's very disappointed in me. But now he has to get back to Granite Deep City to take the ferry back to Kanto. So after wishing him a pleasant trip, we get to talk with the professor. She asks if I'm here for one of her lectures, but that's obviously not the case. I'm here to challenge the gym, and as it turns out, her husband here is the gym leader. So he heads off to his gym and wishes me good luck. And he's definitely not going to hold back on me. Professor also talks to me about evolutionary stones, but I honestly don't really care about that and just want my gym badge. This gym is all about making you feel lost because you're in a weird pit underground and you need to find your way to the right ladder and if you choose the wrong one you have to start all over again. So after getting stuck here for a half an hour I eventually got to the right ladder and defeated about a dozen gym trainers. But now it's finally time to see what Logan has got in his arsenal. He specialized in ground types starting off with the Steelix but we have Patrick the Starfish so we just washed that away with Surf just like Rhyperior. For Garchomp I did switch into Electrode to sack it because I didn't want Patrick to die and I proceeded to bring in Duskwar to kill it with a single ice punch but Mama Swan was too hard for me. He pierced me with his big tusks but Patrick serves one more time and this gives me the Plateau Badge. Upon then going outside the professor comes up to me and tells me we need to head back to Sladeburg City and go into the museum because Team Gaia is trying to get a sample of the hard crystal there. Nobody knows what they're trying to achieve with this but apparently Apparently the police are way too busy so we have to go and stop them. So we get into the museum, battle through everybody but when we get to the end it's already too late because Aqua and Kira are battling both of the bosses but they're too strong for them and they've already acquired a piece of the hard crystal with their special cutters they stole. They need this crystal in order to heal the world, and we will see it later what they will mean by that. And then it would also become clear if we belong to the Chosen Ones or not. Don't know where that came from, but that sentence is definitely directed to me. They then decide to take Kira with them as well as the crystal, and say that if we interfere, Kira might end up injured. This doesn't really scare me because I know I can stop them, but they still managed to steal the entire crystal and got away with it. So me and Aqua are now trying to figure out where they could have taken this crystal, where their base might be, and where they could be keeping Kira. And there is only one place I know they might be at. And that's the port of Granite Deep City. They first ambushed Kira and that delivery guy for those stones. One of those warehouses must be where their secret base is. But before we go and save our friend of imminent danger, I make a stop by the desert and find one of those Skarmories. He seems very injured and we're trying to take him back to the place where he belongs. The the moment we approach it, a shiny Skarmory comes up and attacks me instead, which turns out to be a shiny Nidoqueen. After defeating it, the Skarmory seems to have calmed down and flies off into the distance. Hopefully now the Skarmories will be able to fly over the region without any more problems. So we bring it back to the Skarmory Center and unlock the SAS Pass which will allow us to fly with Skarmories ourselves over the entire region, making traveling a lot easier. We immediately travel with this new feature to Granite deep city and go talk to a big buff man in front of one of the departments. He's like, there is no evil team laird behind here, just go away. We find that rather suspicious and beat up the big buff man. And he was absolutely lying because upon entering, we find an entire base with teleporters, about a billion grunts. And after doing some searching around, the jail where Kira was being held. She thanks me for saving her and knows that they're up to something bad with this heart crystal. She's going to head out, heal up her Pokemon at the Pokemon Center and come back as fast as possible. But everybody knows she's not going to be here on time and I'm going to have to do everything by myself. So we go to the deepest parts of their lair and find their research station, where the guards notify the bosses that we have arrived. They turn around and say that I just can't accept the Earth's fate, but that all of my fighting cannot prevent the inevitable. They then go on to explain what they were doing at the Topaz Oasis with the virus. They did not only want to obtain the Pokerus virus, they also managed to steal a rare item called the Mind Dust there. Behind them, they're currently cutting out the core of the heart crystal, which they will use to combine it with the mind dust to create a soul 
orb. An item that will let you control the Eon Guardians so that they will do all of your bidding without any questions asked. They can't snap out of control and the one that wields this item will be able to use their powers for any purpose they seem fit. They're going to use their power to blast the Sapphire Lake at the top of the region which will cause a tremendous disaster across the entire region. Landslides, floods, only the strong would survive, which is obviously what they're striving for. Just at that moment, the nano cutters are done cutting out the core, so they decide to put their plan in motion and leave Selecto behind to take me on and stall for some time. He had the exact same team as last time, and Garchomp is able to clean up most of his Pokemon with Dig, and then he mentions that he's going to follow Scarlet to Eternity Island, which is in the middle of the sea, surrounded by whirlpools. We were welcome to try and stop them, uh, because he knows we're not going to just let this slide, but he knows that they will succeed in their plans. We leave the hideout and run into Kira and Aqua. After explaining what happened in there, Aqua decides to give me a device that will get rid of the whirlpools and sends me and Kira off on our own to try and stop them while she's going to rile up all of the other gym leaders in case Latios and Latias do attack the region. She wishes us good luck and says to Kira that she needs to keep an eye on her little brother and we easily reach Eternity Island where we find Kira inside side of a cave which we have to traverse together in double battle format and obviously after every battle she will hear your Pokemon so if you need some time to grind up this is it. We then reach the middle of the island where we confront Scarlet and says that she is lost because the Eon Guardians aren't here. But she says that the Eon Guardians don't just hide out in the real world, nope. Once they're done with their duties they go to the Eon Realm. A place where time runs way more slowly than in the real world and also a place where they are safe from everybody else and can watch over the world. So now she uses her soul orb to create a portal to this realm and while she jumps in it she mentions that we can't follow her because we don't have a soul orb of ourselves and then vanishes into nothing. We start panicking because we have no idea how we're going to stop her now but that's when I bring out the soul dew. And legends say that this soul dew has the same properties as the soul orb but the soul dew only gets given to a trainer if they're chosen by Latios or Latias. So with this item we can travel after her but first we make a quick pit stop in the in-between, which is a realm that exists between time and matter where Latios and Latias called us, where they will explain everything to us. Latias says that she chose me because she looked into my soul the first time she met me, and even though I hadn't really accomplished anything yet, she could see that I was full of goodness and had the pure soul that they search for in people. I also impressed them even more with all of the heroic deeds I did, and Latios was surprised to see such a pure soul in a child because most people just want to enrich themselves even if this means that it might hurt other people. But obviously not everybody is like that. But people and Pokemon need to be able to live in harmony. And even if one human wants to accomplish a sinister goal, this could be disastrous to the living conditions of everybody around. That's why we need guardians to make sure everything is balanced. We then go into why Scarlet is doing all of this and enter a flashback of our life. Because there must be a reason why she thinks all of the weaklings need to be wiped out so the strong ones can come on top. As it turns out, as a kid, her mother was very sick and she went to get a secret potion from the Johto region to save her. But on our way back to her mom, she got ambushed by two thugs who stole the secret potion to her and says that she needed to scram because only the strong ones will survive in this world and a weakling like her would be crushed by these two men if she were to interfere even further. From this moment on she has always believed in this philosophy and has worked on herself to get stronger and stronger and wants the entire world to work like this. Which is kind of weird because if you see something bad happen like this this, you might want to go the opposite direction and help people instead, which is what she thinks she's doing by wiping out all the weaklings, but that's obviously wrong. When the flashback ends, Latios still doesn't trust me fully and doesn't even know why Latias picked a child to save the region of all people. 
So in order to prove ourselves, we have to fight Latios and Latias in this special realm. Luckily for me, they randomized it into a Butterfree and an Azumarill, which were way easier to take down than the actual Eon Guardians. With this proven strength, they finally believe that they picked the right person, and they send me over to the Eon universe, where Scarlet is already raging rampant. It kind of feels like a good version of the Distortion world, which I guess is kind of what it is. And after finding your way through the maze, you eventually end up in Scarlet's lap. She's already taking control of Latios and Latias and knows that she's going to be able to fulfill her plan because we're probably not going to be able to stop two legendary Pokemon. So she orders Latios and Latias to attack me, but they refuse because I have, which is obviously the Chosen One's item, and Latios and Latias cannot attack the one that is in possession of this. It's at this point where Scarlet gets a mental breakdown saying that nothing ever goes her way and that it's all my fault. And if Latios and Latias aren't going to stop me, she will do it herself. This time our Dusknoir is going to win the matchup against her Dusknoir by using Shadow Punch and Shadow Sneak. I somehow also take down her Gengar with two Shadow Sneaks. I send Drapion to the Shadow Realm with Garchomp's Dig, pollute Milotic's waters with Gunk Shots from Vileplume, and X scissor her two Darb types, Tyranitar and Umbreon with Scizor. With that last blow, she finally bursts out in tears, saying that her dream is all done, saying that it's all my fault and that she will never forgive me. She absolutely doesn't understand how she lost because she had everything by her side, but still this stupid kid managed to take it all from her. Latios and Latias then go on to explain everything to Scarlet about the purity of my soul, about everything that happened throughout her life, that she's been wrong about all of her beliefs and that they're willing to take her back to that point in time where those two men stole her secret potion so she can realize that her entire life's work was just a manifestation based on revenge. She accepts this because she wants to become a better person and from that point onwards she will promise to try and do the right thing. And even though she just said that she was never going to forgive me, she forgives me. And then they take her back in time and we get teleported back to the real world. Kira says that I finally did it. I've managed to stop Team Gaia and she's super proud of me, but she sees that I'm also exhausted and brings me back to the Professor's Academy where we can rest up and talk about everything. There's also two Elite Four members here to try and make sense of what happened. And after explaining everything, they thank us all, but everybody says that all of the credit goes to me. Finally, some recognition for my actions. As it turns out, the professor asked the Elite Four for help, but they came too late, like always. And they also say that it's great to see that there's so many trainers with this potential, and they can't wait to see me at the Titanium Plateau for our battle. If we manage to reach that. They decide to leave the office and go back to their jobs, but they first give me the Rock Glove, which we can use to push Strength Boulders out of the way. Just what we needed. We go over everything together with our crew one last time. After saying their last congratulations and goodbyes, they know that there is still one more obstacle before we can go to the Elite Four, and that's the last gym badge. Located at the highest frozen peak of the region, this path will definitely be a rough one. But my friends and family believe in me, so I guess we're just going to have to go through with it. So first we take a train through the mountain to Up Clay Town, which honestly was just a quiet little town with nothing in it, but it did lead to a frozen mountain that I had to get through, which was one of the roughest and hardest paths ever, but it did finally lead me to the frozen peak where we entered the very last gym. The inside of the gym wasn't frozen though, it was filled with rotation pads and teleport pads which made for a very annoying puzzle to solve but in the end we were able to challenge Alexa and she does not have ice types she is specialized in steel which is way cooler Patrick drowned Skarmory but then got slashed into pieces by Scizor but my Electro's charge beams and discharges were enough to take down the Scizor and the next Pokemon Metagross and after doing about half of Aggron's health I did finally fall to win a super effective Earthquake I then send in Scizor who Meteor Mashed the big bad rhino, and her last Pokemon was a beautiful Empoleon. 
still don't really understand why this thing is a steel type. That doesn't stop my scissor from mashing it in the face with not very effective moves and eventually coming out on top and complete my collection with the Titan Badge. Even though Alexa was a pretty cool name for an AI, I think the Gym Leader wasn't that strong for a final one. So let's head on over to the Obsidian Path where we meet up with Aqua and our mother who are here to check out our qualifying rounds for the Pokemon League Elite Four. That's right, you can't just enter Victory Road after your eight badges. First, you need to compete against other trainers with eight badges before they grant you permission to go there. My mom and sister are obviously really proud of me and are going to try and watch every single one of our matches. Kira has also gotten her eight gym badges and is trying to compete for the Elite Four spot too. But as we're talking about our journeys, Ken comes walking out and is like, I've already completed my tournament and I'm heading straight for the Pokemon League right Right now. I'll be champion before you guys even complete yours. Me and Kira then make a pact that whoever wins this tournament will go up to the Pokemon League and knock Ken down because he can't keep up this insanely annoying attitude. So I go to the reception desk, do all of my matches and end up in the final against Kira, which honestly wasn't that much of a surprise, but she wouldn't have wanted it any other way. But I started off with a bang because I gave my Garchomp a choice band and used Outrage on Blissey and Altaria to get them out of the picture. Her Ampharos was no problem either, but her Milotic was a little bit too thick for my land shark this time, so I had to make sure to put some volts behind it with Boom. Patrick extinguished the flames of her Rapidash and her Meganium went down to huge gunk shots. With that, everybody congratulates me for winning the Pokemon League qualifiers. As we exit the stadium, my mom says that my dad would be so proud of me if he was still here and not getting milk. And they even thought that Kira would mop the floor with me. Not having faith in your own son, huh? I'll remember this when I'm champion. But this isn't the end of my journey yet, they're still going to follow me around to the actual Pokemon League where they can check up with my matches against the Elite Four and eventually champion. I now get access to Victory Road so we make our way through that which was honestly nothing special it was pretty cool that the pokemon league is located on an island in the middle of a lake now it's time for the final stretch of this game starting out with nora the fighting type user but i have a patrick star on my team and even her super effective heracross couldn't survive a psychic then we go up to her buff machamp and after exploding his head galade gets dragged into the shadows by the snoir and the last two pokemon polyrath and lucario felt the my newly acquired gliscor acrobatics and earthquakes. The second member is a familiar face, Cliff, the guy that came to congratulate us. And for once, he actually didn't specialize in a single typing, although a lot of his Pokemon were ground types. He started out with a Steelix, which was no problem for Patrick, Pitcher dealt with his Kangaskhan, Rhyperior and Mamoswine got absolutely mashed by Meteors, and the final Pokemon Crobat did manage to take me down with Air Slashes, but I showed him a superior flying type with Gliscor's Acrobat. On to Dusk, who also doesn't specialize in the single typing, but has a mix of ghost types, dark types, and psychic types. And it was a pretty cool double battle. Starting out with an Umbreon and an Espeon really gave me Pokemon Colosseum vibes, but his Espeon fell on the first turn with a Surf and an X Scissor. His Gengar and Umbreon then managed to take down both of my Pokemon, but I countered back by taking out Umbreon with Sky Uppercut from Gliscor, while they brought in Absol and I sent out my Dusknoir. I then cleaned up these two with Gliscor and Flareon, but Alakazam's dazzling gleam eventually whittled me down onto my last Pokemon, Garchomp. 1v1. I know this thing has dazzling gleam, but it couldn't one-shot me. On the other hand, I just outraged and killed. One more Elite Four member to go, and that's Tamara, who kind of looks like a female Koga, but specializes in dragon types instead. Despite being the last Elite Four member, this was the easiest. And because I had learned Blizzard to Patrick, I could just one-shot her four times super effective Flygon and Altaria, but then Kingdra came out which I then cleaned up with two Psychics, and the last two Pokemon are also four times weak to Blizzard, Garchomp, and Dragonite get sent back to the Ice Age. Since this region doesn't have a champion, that means we must be the champion of Terror. If Ken hadn't made it here before me. Despite losing against me on his entire journey, not winning a single time, he still mocks me for being weak and coming here to the champion spot second. Now he's the champion of the region, and he will gladly 
accept my challenge as he's ready to pummel me into the ground. But we have the power of friendship by our side. So what did I do? I started out with Flareon and ate his scissor for breakfast with a fire fang. I superpowered his Tyranitar too, but then his Swampert came out and since I threw my grass type off the team, I don't really have an answer for it. But with the combined powers of Starmie Surfs and Carbite's Outrages, this beautiful majestic Swamp Beast falls. His Obama Snow survives an outrage, counters back with an avalanche, and that's the end of my very own 4 times weak to ice land shark. I bring in Scizor to try and win this matchup, but just before I can take out the big bad snowman, she swaps into Salamance who fire fangs, burns, and flinches me in the same turn, killing my ace. But it's time for Ice to rule again, as we take down the mighty dragon and go into Arcanine. I start rock sliding away, and just when I'm about to bury this Arcanine, he swaps out into Obama Snow, and I bury that instead. The Arcanine comes back in and gets off one more flamethrower after this, but I survive, counter back with a last rock slide, and make sure... Ken is dethroned as champion. Ken then goes on a rambling session as he doesn't understand how he can lose against this bunch of loser Pokemon, but then the professor comes in and explains to Ken that he's a really strong trainer, but he doesn't have the soul that I have. I work together with my Pokemon and believe in them while he just goes ahead and picks a couple of strong ones and makes a team out of them. That's what differentiates us, and that's why he lost today, not because he's an NPC in a Pokemon game. After that, the professor congratulates me and says that there will be tons of challengers that would love to take me on in the future. But for now, we're going to register our Pokemon in the Hall of Fame and end off Pokemon Eon Guardians with a bang. There is a ton of post-game content from what I understand, but I'm not going to take that on in this video. If you would like to see that in maybe a future video, definitely leave it down in the comments below. And if I would have to rate this game out of 10, I would probably give it an 8 out of 10. I know it seems very repetitive, but it's really hard to explain the story. You just have to play the game yourself if you want to experience how good and well-crafted everything feels. From the battle animations, to the beautiful graphics, to the story that's honestly a 7 out of 10 itself, this game was an absolute blast to play and you should try it out if you haven't already. There is a ton of lagging if you play for a long time, but honestly I think that's just the engine's fault, not really the game itself. And I also would have liked to see more Pokemon in this game because only 4 generations is a little bit cheap, but at least they can all follow you. Now with all of that out of the way, I want to thank my membership and Patreon supporters for supporting the channel. If you want to do so yourself, you can click the links in the description. It is always appreciated, but not needed. And as always people, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe and share this video with your friends. I'm Zwigo and I'll see you guys next time.